Daryush for inviting me and Julia and Naushin for all of their work on the meeting. It's such a pleasure to come to London after um, many years and for, thank you for bringing me from the wilds of Oregon and the um, Nuxay resources I've been working on to have me return to Ismailism. So I thought, you know, given that the meeting is on the state of the field, I just wanted to make some remarks on some really important innovations, contributions, um, sort of pools of evidence and argument that several scholars have recently brought to the origins of Ismailism, and in particular, Daniel Vesmet, who's, who's with us. Um, so I wanted to start with something rather far away from the, our topic. Um, in his essay, What a Difference a Difference Makes, the historian of religion, Jonathan Z. Smith, offers the concluding stanza of the great Scottish poet Robert Burns uh, in his poem, To a Louse. And I apologize to the people of Scotland, past and present, for my accent, but I'll do my best here. Uh, oh, with some power the gift ye give us, to see ourselves as either see us. It would for money a blunder free us, and foolish notion, but airs in dress and gates would lee us, and even devotion. The language of the poem is not standard English, but as the distinguished historian of Scottish literature, Kurt Wittig, points out, a shift of spelling of several words would make the couplets almost indistinguishable from it. Is it near enough that it should be considered English? Wittig opines, no, the poem is written in Scots, but that it is a form of Scots that may be considered near English. Now, Burns wrote to allow soon after the establishment of the Select Society for the Reading and Speaking of the English Language at Edinburgh, an institution devoted to promoting the English tongue in Scotland. Burns's Scottish contemporary Adam Smith composed poetry in standard English, as did Burns elsewhere. Burns's decision to write this poem in Scots was a conscious one. It would seem that while the language of the poem may be near English, it was politically quite far. The issues in categorizing the language of Burns's poem, I think, parallel some of those which arise in attempting to identify the origins of Ismailism, and that I expect will likely animate the study of early Shiism more generally in the coming years. When does similarity signify the continuity of identity, or conversely, when do small differences signal attempts to separate oneself from contemporaries or prior legacies? In considering the origins of Ismailism, um, we, may, we, we must ask whether similarities between early sources reflect continuity, or conversely, um, might near Ismailism be at times be politically far? When do small differences reflect the articulation of something new? So I'm going to give now the, what I take to be a rather, well, of course, crude version of what, what I take as the standard account pre-intervention of um, recent scholarship. So the standard account of early Ismailism is usually told in two historical phases. The first phase takes us to a succession dispute following the death of the Imam Jafar Sadiq and the emergence of one group which held that the MMH resides in Jafar's son Ismail and then Ismail's son Muhammad. The second phase jumps a century later with the rise of the Dawah al Haq, a mission of truth, a socio political movement that rose in the middle of the ninth century on Muhammad ibn Ismail's behalf. Now we have a great deal of knowledge about this second phase when a religio political movement arose, which came to be directed from Salamiya. Um, on behalf of this leadership, missionaries in such sites as Iraq, Yemen, Bahrain, eventually North Africa, taught a particular form of Salvific esoteric knowledge to initiates <laughs> who believed themselves as part of a divinely inspired Dawah, a mission devoted to replacing the Caliph in Baghdad with the divinely inspired descendant of the Prophet. Now, while much has been written on the history of the doctrines of the Dawah during the second phase, for the first phase, the paucity of sources and the remoteness in time to it has left its status and the connection between it and the second phase uncertain. In consequence, most accounts of Ismailism effectively present this first phase as preliminary and effect effectively leave the story of the origins of Ismailism as an account of the second phase. Now, according to the standard account that I'm still in here, the sources for this initial phase are mainly 10th century 12 or heresiographies, a genre notoriously problematic as a source for history. The problem can be seen in al Qumi's account in his al muqallad al fiqh al Qumi writes that after the execution of the heresiarch Abu Khattab, some of, the, some of his followers transferred their allegiance to Ja'far's son Ismail. al Qumi thus characterizes Ismailism, or the origins of Ismailism, as a development that emerged from Khatibism. 
And this account nicely explains the concepts and themes shared by what we know of Chatism in early Ismaili um, and early Ismaili sources, such as the Nautic Samets and um, the priority of the Batan and over the Lahir and um, their political aspirations. However, there is good reason for being skeptical of El Khomi's claim. The genre in which it appears, heresiography, is more concerned with doctrine than history. Moreover, her heresiographers such as El Khomi like to schematize the dispersion of doctrine with the proliferation of groups. It is thus difficult to know whether this account reflects an historical kernel, whether such an account was El Khomi's way of explaining the similarities which he knew of concerning the documents of the Khatabi and Ismailis. Now, modern historians have treated El Khomi's account with caution. More sanguine historians, such as Dr. Duftery, accept that El Khomi's report may have some credence in general terms, if not specifics, claim buttressed by the recent discovery of um, Abu Hatim Razi's reference to this in the Kitab Zina, which also uh, connected the Khatabis uh, to early Ismailism. Others, such as Stern, Hal, Madelung, Hamdan, Ham, uh, Hamdani, and uh, de Blois, while recognizing some connection between phase one and two, characterize this connection as remote. Hall, in particular, does not include these smileys. It is important monograph on the Gnostic Ulat, and this seems to suggest that the link between the early smileism and the Muhammadsa, the quietest 8th and 9th century Kupan Ulat, associated with Mufadal ibn Omar and his traditions, is quite remote indeed. And just to, say, I'm going to summarize just a bit of this, just to save time, Essentially, if, when you read Halm and his work on these early Ismaili, Ismailia, the sense one gets is that maybe there's some connection between these, um, these Gulats, but he's more, um, he seems to think that there's more of a direct connection with the Val Valentinian Gnostics that seems to be non-Ismaili sources. And it, it, he writes a distinct article on the, the Kuni, the, the feminine demiurge, which is not found in Gulat sources. So one gets the impression that there's a bit of a, a firewall between these two pools. Um, so, um, so in short, um, our current account of Ismailism's origins posits a proto-Ismaili phase, which has an oblique and uncertain connection to the fully realized Dawah to Haq a century later, of uh, the period when Ismailism was fully realized. Um, and most scholars have basically, I think largely due to Holmes and to some degree Madeline's in, uh, influence, really maintained this division. So now the the critique or the um, you know the new the new material in his article on Docetism and G MMology, Daniel Vesmet discusses evidence that presents problems with this account. Um, it has become commonplace to label pseudo epigraphic works attributed to the eighth century Kufan Mufaddal ibn Omar al Jafi and his companions as proto Nusayri and to reject their connection to Ismailism. Take one example, the Kitab al Haftul Adilla uh, is a pseudo epigraphic treatise ascribed to Mufaddal, but probably composed sometime later. And it's described by scholars as a paradigmatic proto Nusayri source and not an Ismaili one. However, as Dr. Desmet notes, the Kitab al Haft was preserved by the Nazari Ismailis in Syria. It's adduced in the Kitab al Kashf, one of the earliest Ismaili sources, and of course, as well in Tayyibi sources uh, in extensio. And one possible explanation for this is that the Nazaris adopted this source resulted, uh, was a result of Nusayri influence where they found it. But such an explanation does not account for the fact that the Tayyibis of Yemen and India also adopt the Kitab al Haft and induce Mufat al Omar as an authority. Similar issues could be repeated, and Dr. Desmet goes through or refers to them in the Kitab al Um, Kitab al Ashbah, the Kitab al Sirat, uh, Sirat uh, sources that are also termed proto Nusayri, but likewise adduced in Tayyibi sources. If such works did not originate as Ismaili sources, why did so many Ismaili communities, including communities far from uh, Nusayri influence, adopt them and the authorities which, which they are associated, such as Mufat al Omar? So this is one thing. Another thing. Uh, further, Dr. Desmet notes that categorizing Mufat traditions as foreign to early Ismailism has led to some questionable interpretations of early Ismaili works, most importantly, several epistles in the Kitab al Kashf, which draws heavily from Mufat traditions. Rather than representing a case of 10th century Nusayri Ismaili syncretism or an Ismaili update to a proto Nusayri original, the Kadabal Kash could be seen as a late witness to a prior Ismaili phase which incorporated Muhammadsa themes and ideas only to be excised by later Ismaili missionaries as Hulu. Such a thesis parallels Professor Amir Mouazi's recovery of the esotericist roots of Imami Shiism, as similarly um, um, an excerpt. 
which similarly has an early, posits an early esoterica, which was later kind of claimed to be Hulu by later rationalist Twelver scholars. In other words, while well, while can certainly generate, I mean, to say this sort of differently, one can generate different explanations for these two, for these various um, pools of evidence that Dr. Desbet mentions. His explanation is of an origins of the imagining an origins of this malice, which incorporated this material, a conservative phase of Fatima period, and then a, a later in the Taibi period, re-embrace of that early traditions is one theory which explains both the manuscript issue, the fact that you have these, um, well, I'm about to talk about these Otios traditions and also the Kitabul Kash. So, um, so thus, um, Dr. Dismet suggests that Ismailism, non rational 12er Shiism, and Nusarism shared an original in mid 8th century Kufa, Basra, and the surrounding area. Um, I think the most, for me, the most persuasive and exciting, and I think that really the thing that's going to have the most influence of his work, and it's in several articles, is um, the wealth of evidence he, he shows, which demonstrates the persistence of, a, of various theological themes. So one of them is this, um, the theme of Docetism, the idea that there's the, these bodies of prophets and imams such as Jesus and Hussein were conceived of as sh shirts, fleshy coverings that the owner could shed or put on at any time. You can read a lot of accounts of Ismailism that ha doesn't mention this, but um, Dr. Desmet does uh, this run with, um, well, I'm going to tell, read a little bit about it. Um, uh, it shows this continuity. So you have, um, starting within the Hulat sources, a disciple of Abu Khattab named Muammar describes the divine principle as spirit and the bodies of the prophets and imams and inhabits as khawalib, shells or molds, a term also found in the Kitab al Haft and the Umul Kitab. Okay, so here it is in the Hulat strata early. You also have these khawalib occur in the Kitab al Shajra, 10th century Karmatian source um, by Abu Tamam. Uh, um, it, which refers to the imam's dense bodily form uh, as a mold, a qalib, uh, in which a subtle and spiritual form, uh, Surah Latif al-Ruhaniya, dwells through the support ta'id of the intellect. So it's a smile, a smiley, a smiley update to a, to a um, gulu theme. Um, in the Tawil al zakat uh, by Jafar bin Surah Yemen, he also describes prophets and imams as angels who take human clothing in the form of molds, kawalib. Now I can tell you, you can read, um, well, who become bodily angels. When they leave their bodies, they become uh, spiritual angels. So again, it's the same, the, the term kawalib is specific enough that I'm I was really, and I'm honestly, I've read quite a lot of um, Fatima and Ismaili sources and never noticed it. And I'm starting to feel that, that this firewall that Hamas set up has prevented us from seeing a lot of things, which Dr. Desmet is discovering and making us really question this, um, uh, that, that, that kind of schema. Um, the presence of Kualib and Fatwa in period sources in particular is particularly arresting as it is not, um, it's not a known Ismaili term. It suggests this connection with the Kulu. Um, yeah. So, um, so one consequence of this account I'm going to talk about very briefly is um, a, a soon-to-be-published work by um, Ferris um, Gion, um, which I think is a particularly strong example of this method applied to a particular work, the Kitab al -Kashf. Um And so, as is well known, several treatises within the Kashf, particularly the first and third treatise, bristle with these Vulat terms, and um, Kitab al Haft decided um, at length. And so the question is, what is it doing in the, you know, what is the Ismaili, so Madeleine writes about, many people have written about this, Hall and Madeleine, et cetera, as an update, a sort of Ismaili finishing of an earlier uh, Hulat work. Um, Dr. Um, Gion sees it slightly differently. He shows that when the author of the third treatise, for example, of the Kash presents Salman, Abu Dhar, and al Muqdad as hujaj proofs, so that triad is well known from the earlier sources, a rank below the imam in the Ismaili Fatimid hierarchy, he thinks that the author, which is who he thinks is an early Fatimid author, is consciously transfiguring Hulat traditions, which held Salman as a bab and, and gauge over the Yatims of Dudar and al -Mikdad. So much of this Hulat material on the cash um, for um, uh, Dr. Gion uh, um, represents Fatimid Ismaili response to rival Shia. Um, this thesis is corroborated independently by Mushik Asatrian in another article on the Kitab al Kash, who similarly shows that these Muhammadan materials are subordinated to the phase two Ismaili Dawa type. 
So uh, Dr. Gio argues that it is this intentional reshaping of early materials for particular communal and political ends connected to the Dawa, connected to the Dawa, which constitutes the determining factor for distinctive Ismailism. So for the author of the first and third treatises, the Kitab al-Kash, it would seem that these Muhammad said Topoi are thematically close, but politically far, going back to the poem, you know? So, so that's for the, that's in the Dawa phase. Remember, Dr. Gio, the Kitab al-Kash is either in the late, um, uh, sort of immediately pre-Fatimid uh, phase, if you follow Madeleine, or the early Fatimid, if you follow Dr. Gio. But in any case, it still doesn't rebut Dr. Dismet's thesis. Remember, he's talking about the earlier phase. So the question is, if they're still in the Fatimid period, in the early Fatimid period, wrestling with the Gulat sources, could there be an earlier period before which the Dawa got going, where it was just commonplace, this material? Um, um, in other words, if, if in the Fatimid period, the Ismaili missionaries needed to adapt and reframe this, these Gulat to Topoi, this could be understood as evidence that these materials were inherited from the pre-Dawa phase, and the need to rationalize and transfigure this material came from the rise of the Dawa, which is something new. Um, okay, so just to work toward, to step toward my conclusion, now, do we have enough material to posit that the origins of Ismailism returned to phase one? Is there a sufficient continuity between the 8th century Iraq uh, um, that there, that, that it began with a sort of big tent Ismailism that encompassed the Mufaddal bin Omar traditions, etc., of uh, Muhammad's Gnosticism, and then went into abeyance during the Fatimid period, only to return with the Taibis and um, later Nizaris. I suppose part of the answer comes to the what do we mean by origins and what do we mean by Ismailism, right? So if we mean by origins a palette of teachings of Gnostic concepts, images, topoi, mythemes. I think the Dr. Dismet's case is quite strong. If we mean the origins of a coherent community of believers, um, then it gets less certain. Um, and so let's just imagine for a second that Ismailism began with, in Iraq with figures who held Gnostic doctrines you know, along the lines that we see, that we see in the Muhammad and the Mufaddal corpus, and that these doctrines were similar to the, um, the beliefs of non-Ismaili Kufan and Basran circles that were sitting with Muhammad ibn Sinan learning about Jafra Asadik's uh, wisdom. Um, as these same beliefs were shared by these other groups, what's the distinguishing factor that makes the Ismailis the Ismailis as you were? Well, it would need to be the commitment to the Imam, to, we're back to the genealogy, right? That's what would distinguish them in contradistinction to other choices for who the, the Imam is. And the question is, is the identity of the mom alone sufficient as the basis for such a community? And here I started thinking about it, and you know, um, there's a the passage we all love from the Kitab al Alam al Ghulam, um, where the Ghulam is asked, the boy is asked his true name and whether he was free. And he responds that his new name is a servant of God, Abdullah, son of a servant of God, right? Abdullah ibn Abdullah. Um, and his, this servant of God who set him free, the, in other words, the missionary who uh, adopted him into the movement, is, who's his spiritual father, is the one who has set him, has liberated him from his ignorance. But the, but the interrogator asks, how do you know that he is free? You, if you're not, how do you know, you know your name is an authentic name and your freedom is actual if you can't be certain of his status? And the Ghulam is downcast because he realizes he can't. In other words, certitude can only come Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, the certitude can only come from a sort of regression that leads to the identity of the Imam, who he doesn't know yet. And so his his conversion is not complete until he knows the identity of the Imam. Um, so I, I sort of see this as almost a parallel, I think, for the, one of the proofs, the famous proofs of the existence of God, that creator as a creator as a creator, you have to have a first. So too in this, I think, in this mod, in this this is a kind of a wink to that, but you need to have the imam to, fat, to know your own name in this community. And so this could be taken as, you know, I suppose if one wanted to follow, um, you know, how could the identity of the imam alone be sufficient, this could be a kind of possibility. Um, but then the question of what evidence do we have that such a community actually existed in this early, early phase? Um, well, I know this is just one little, um, Factoid in Dr. Madeline's famous article on the MMA that the Zaidi Imam Al Qasim ibn Ibrahim 
writing before phase two, you know, in the heart of phase one, knows of a Shia, knows of Shia, expecting the return of Muhammad and Ismail, but he does not write of them as any associated with any Dawa. So we seem to have had Muhammad and Ismail followers pre Dawa, not associated with any political movement. So we know they exist. You know, we know they existed. Another little factoid is um, Abbas Hamdani's and Dubois' famous article about the Mahdi's letter to Yemen, which he suggests, I mean, they, they read it, they note that the, um, the Mahdi writes that in this period, he gives an account where there's a revivification of the Dawah, that it had gone into abeyance, imagining an early period. So again, you have this idea of prior to, uh, yeah, prior to, prior to the continuity we have, uh, that. So anyway, just to, to finish up then, are we ready to drop the proto Ismaili from the Ismaili and uh, follow Dr. Dismet in this? And I think basically not quite, because most of our evidence is coming from extrapolation. In other words, we have certain evidence in the Kitab al-Kash, but nothing behind it, which is really speaking. We're just kind of, a, 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 for a community, we have to do some imagination. But I think that it's no longer possible to read early Ismaili sources without reading them in light of the corpus. I think that the, the Muhammad corpus, which has gotten quite large with a lot of recent publications. So I think that's the shift that we have to, um, that supported the Dr. Desmond and Dr. Gino's work uh, occasions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Daftari. Thank you, Dariush and the organizing committee for putting together this excellent conference. I'd like to begin by saying that a fuller version of this paper is to be published in Muslim Sicily, Encounters and Legacy, which has been edited by Noha Ashar uh, with the Edinburgh University Press um, in summer 2023. The status of the Kalbid Amirs as the only governing dynasty of Muslim <clears throat> Sicily and as Fatimid viceroys is well known in scholarship. Descendants of the Arabian tribesmen of the Kalb who had settled in Ifriqiya over the previous centuries and who in the early 10th century entered into Fatimid service, the governorship of the Kalbids began with the appointment of Al Hassan bin Ali as governor of the island in 948 during the reign of the third Fatimid Imam Caliph Al Mansur. Thereafter, the Kalbids continued their rule as Fatimid viceroys with brief interruptions until 1053. The century of Kalbid rule saw the flourishing of Muslim Sicily as an agricultural powerhouse, a center of Mediterranean trade, and a locus of cultural efflorescence. Yet, the largely exclusive focus on the Kalbid Sicilian rule has often eclipsed their salient influence in Fatimid Ifriqiya. This has characterized the Kalbids as an important but ultimately provincial dynasty of governors. It has similarly rendered Sicily, whose economic integration with Fatimid Ifriqiya is now well established as an important frontier island province, but one where ultimately its own elites and power relations had little impact on the internal dynamics of the Fatimid court. A close reading of primary accounts of the Ifriqian phase of Fatimid history including Fatimid accounts such as the Sirat al Jawdar, demonstrates that the political and dynastic involvement of the Kalbid household extended beyond Sicily, impacting various spheres of the Fatimid state. This extended role of the Kalbids is somewhat obscured in the reports of medieval Sunni Muslim chroniclers, but becomes increasingly evident when they are read in conjunction with Fatimid accounts. The sources attest that whilst in Ifriqiya, the Fatimid Imam Caliphs appointed several members of the Kalbid household to leading positions in their army and navy. Importantly, select members of the Kalbid family were also entrusted as guardians of the Fatimid succession process. This reflects an intimate intertwining of relations between the Kalbid and Fatimid households. This paper charts the broader role of the Kalbids and repositions Sicily at the heart of the Fatimid venture rather than on its political periphery. It also explores relations between various members of the Fatimid dynasty and the Kalbids spanning several generations. The Kalbids in the Arabic historical tradition, 
The vicissitudes of the Kalbit dynasty receive significant coverage in medieval Muslim chronicles. These include the writings of Abul Fida, Ibn al Athir, Ibn Idari, Al Nawari, Ibn Khaldun, and Al Makrizi. The predominant concern in these sources, however, is on Kalbid military history. Fatimid Ismaili sources provide a significant body of otherwise unknown historical information on the Kalbids. The Sirat al Usta Jawdar preserves documents and letters pertaining to the Kalbids, which include their religious proclivities, their internal family dynamics, their relations with the Fatimid household, and their role in the Fatimid state. The Kitab al-Majalis wal-Musayarat by Qadi al numan also provides distinct perspectives on the Kalbids. An overview of the Kalbids in Sicily. The Kalbids likely entered Fatimid service soon after the proclamation of their caliphate. Their path bearer was Ali bin Abil Hussein, a notable military figure and son-in-law of Salim bin Abi Rashid, the Fatimid governor of Sicily from 925 to 936. The details of Ali's own career in the Fatimid state are obscure. However, it is apparent that the close association of the Kalbids with Sicily seemingly commences during his era and that by the time of his demise, the Kalbid household was already of special interest at the Fatimid court. Sira Chowder records that when Ali's career was cut short while fighting rebels in Agriganto in 938, the Fatimid Imam Caliph al Qayyim issued instructions to Jowder to take the Kalbid's two sons, Al Hassan and Jafar, into his care. Of these two, it was Al Hassan who next attained a high ranking position in the Fatimid realms rising through the ranks of the military before coming to the fore during the rebellion of Abu Yazid and Nukari between 943 to 947. It was in Sicily, however, that Al Hassan and his kinsmen made their mark. By the mid 10th century, the Fatimid administration in Sicily had succumbed to the same challenges faced by the previous Aglabid rulers. Fatimid efforts to impose centralized control and provincial bureaucratization were resisted, especially by the settled descendants of the Arab army. Following the pattern of appointing prominent Arab Ismailis as mediators of Fatimid governance in especially fractious regions, Al Mansur set, sent Al Hassan bin Ali to Sicily in 948. Al Hassan pacified Palermo and secured a series of major victories against the resurgent Byzantines. This strengthened the Fatimid presence on the island and elevated the status of the Kalbids in the Fatimid domains. Returning to the Fatimid capital following the accession of Al Mu'iz in 953, Al Hassan's career as a stalwart of the Fatimid realms continued its ascent. Following a tentative Umayyad Byzantine alliance against the Fatimids, he was appointed by Al Mu'iz to lead a successful Fatimid naval expedition against the Umayyad port of Almira in Andalusia, a rare example of direct Fatimid Umayyad military confrontation. Al Hassan later returned to Sicily to lead further expeditions against the Byzantines before passing away in 964. At the same time, other members of the Kalbid clan were rising. Hassan's brother Amar bin Ali had also distinguished himself during the rebellion of Abu Yazid by routing Khariji forces in Tunis. Amar was then dispatched by his brother Al Hassan to lead a naval fleet against Byzantine Italy, where he died at sea in 956. In Sicily, the eminence of the Kalbid family translated into their third generation enlisting in Fatimid service. Al Hassan's son Ahmad was selected to succeed him in ruling over the island. Ahmad oversaw the reform of Sicily's provincial administration. Ahmad's military successes against the Byzantines further heightened his fame. Especially notable was his conquest of Taormina in 962, among the last Byzantine strongholds on the island, which he renamed Al Muizia in honor of the Fatimid Al Muiz. Similarly prominent was Ahmad's paternal cousin, 
Al-Hassan bin Amar, who alongside Ahmad commanded Fatimid forces and gained renown for major victories against the Byzantines, notably at the Battle of the Pit near Rometa in 964. Following a brief period of Kalbid absence in Sicily, leading to the return of civil war between the Arabs and Berbers, al muiz appointed Ali bin al-Hassan, another son of al-Hassan, as governor in 970. He reigned over the island until his death in battle in 982. A detailed review of the Kalbids in Fatimid Sicily is outside the scope of this paper. Suffice it to say that Kalbid rule continued in Sicily until the early decades of the 11th century, ending with the ninth Kalbid ruler, Ahmad bin Ahkal, a fourth generation descendant of Al Hassan bin Ali. Kalbids as intimate scions of the Fatimid house. The importance of the Kalbids as stalwarts of the Fatimid house in North Africa preceded their career in Fatimid, as Fatimid viceroys in Sicily. The critical importance of Al-Hassan's contribution in quelling the rebellion of Abu Yazid is documented in medieval Ismaili sources, such as the Uyun al-Akbar of Imad al Idris. As governor of Tunis, Al-Hassan led the Fatimid defense of the coastal region of northern Ifriqiya against Abu Yazid's force in September 944. After civil strife forced the Kalbids to relocate to Sus, Al-Hassan continued the assault against Abu Yazid's forces, leading to the successful defense of the region. Following the Fatimid al-Mansur's tide-turning victory against Abu Yazid in 946 outside Kairavan, he dispatched a force against the recalcitrant elements in the Kutama homelands. This led to further mobilization of the Fatimid tribal support base, which then coalesced under the command of Al Hassan al Kalbi. Together, they secured Constantine, Baja, and Tunis. And, sorry, Al Hassan and Amar's contributions augmented the state of the Kalbids as preeminent generals and governors of the empire, leading to inevitable court jealousies. The distinct status of the Kalbids at the Fatimid court and their being subject to factional rivalry is also evident in the earlier controversies during the reign of al-Mansur. Similarly, targe seemingly targeted specifically to diminish Kalbid influence, they were only curbed through the intervention of al muiz then serving as heir apparent, who is reported to have said to Jaudar and I quote, you know that when arrows of their enemies hit the Kalbids, when they had almost perished by the anger of their Imam, you appealed to us and we appealed to Al-Mansur to spare them. And he acted towards them in a way which is worthy of him. Since you did not, did not abandon them at that time, you must not abandon them today." End of quote. Additionally, an intimacy between the members of the Banu Abil Hussein and the Fatimid household that spent generations is apparent in Sira Chowder. Following Al Qaim's instruction to Chowder to take Ali bin Kalbi's sons into his care, the bond between the Kalbid brothers and Chowder continued into adulthood and survived the noted controversies. Chowder's role as the custodian of the Kalbid house was reinforced by Al Muiz. Following the demise of Al Hassan bin Ali, Jaudar continued overseeing the care of his heirs. The relationship between the Fatimids and the Kalbids extended over various other members of the two households, with Al Muiz pronouncing, and I quote, the, the place that Al Hassan Al Kalbi's children and family hold in our regard is such that, by God, in our opinion, the gift of the most considerable favors of God would not be too great for them, end of quote. While the religious proclivities of the earlier progenitors of the Kalbid house remain unclear, the Ismaili affinity of the Banu Abil Hussein to the Fatimids is evident. al muiz is said to have proclaimed that God had granted for Al-Hassan Al-Kalbi, and I quote, his most perfect favors outwardly and inwardly, and that he was as blissful in his death as he was in his life and God had reserved for him a handsome reward and a notable place of return. 
The allegiance of the women of the Kalbid household is apparent from a report that the mother of Al Hussein and wife of Ali had requested to be allowed to buy a house close to the palace of the commander of the faithful because of the blessings associated with it. Al Mu'iz exceeded, noting that he himself would pay for the necessary sum. In all likelihood, the Kalbids served as the conduits of the Ismaili Dawa in Syria, as reported by Abu Fida who says in the year 959, Ahmad bin al Hassan, alongside 30 elites from Sicily, came to Al Mu'iz in Ifriqiya. They gave the baya to Al Mu'iz and he enrobed them and then reappointed Ahmad to his position in Sicily. The Kalbids as guardians of Fatimid succession. The Kalbids' importance as guardians of Fatimid succession has remained understudied. It is in the reports on Muhammad bin al Hassan, one of the lesser known sons of al Hassan, that this linkage becomes apparent. Born in 933, two years after al Mu'iz, Muhammad grew up in the same circles and the two became very close. In his adult years, Muhammad is described as one of the select companions of al Mu'iz and the one closest to him. Muhammad accompanied al Mu'iz in the migration to Egypt and upon his death in 974, Al Makrizi reports that while Qadi and Noman led the funeral prayer over him, it was Al Mu'iz and his heir apparent at the time, Abdullah, who placed his body in the tomb. In 969, when Al Mu'iz appointed his son Abdullah as his heir apparent, Jawdar was the first to be told. Seven months later, however, according to the Sirat Jawdar, the circle was extended to include leading figure of the Kutama Berbers, as well as Muhammad bin al Hassan al Kalbi. The pattern was to repeat itself in Egypt some two decades later. As is well established, the fifth Fatimid Imam Caliph al Aziz, upon his deathbed at Bil Bilbais, entrusted al Hassan bin Amar alongside the eunuch Barjawan to oversee the succession of his young son al Hakim. In doing so, Al Aziz was following his father's precedent of securing succession through the tried and tested loyalty of the Kalbid house. To the final section, the Kalbids and the transfer to Egypt. The importance of the Kalbids is amplified by Al Muiz's instruction for them to accompany him en masse to Egypt, as noted by Al Nuweri. And I quote Al Muiz ordered the Amir Ahmad to leave Sicily and come to Ifriqiya. So he left with all his family, his wealth, his sons, and his brothers. They rode on 30 vessels, and none of them remained in Sicily." End of quote. The scale of the Kalbid departure indicates that al Muiz had envisaged a prominent role for the Kalbids in Egypt. Circumstances, however, dictated otherwise. The former Sicilian governor, Ahmad, died on the way to Egypt in October 970 at Tripoli. The failed rule of his father's Mawla Yaish over Sicily led Al Muiz to instruct Ahmad's brother Ali to, re to reign over Sicily. Al Muiz's companion Muhammad bin Al Hassan died soon after their arrival in Egypt. The deaths of Ahmad and Muhammad and the requirement to send Ali to restore stability in Sicily meant that by 974, three of the most prominent Kalbids were no longer by Al Muiz's side. Nonetheless, the Kalbids retained significant gravitas in Egypt. In 982, the death of Ali led to the succession of his son Jabir as governor of Sicily. However, Jabir's heavy handed rule led the Sicilians to petition Al Muiz to appoint a replacement who dispatched Jafar bin Muhammad. The reasons for Jafar's departure to Sicily are also linked to rivalries triggered by the prominence of the Kalbids at the Fatimid court in Egypt, as noted by Abul Fida, and I quote, Jafar was a devoted follower of Al-Aziz and was extremely close to him. Al-Aziz had a wazir called Ibn Kilis, who became jealous of Jafar. When Ali bin Hassan was killed, Ibn Kilis suggested that Jafar be appointed to govern over Sicily. So Al-Aziz sent him. Jafar proceeded to Sicily, though he did not want to do so. He remained the governor of Sicily until his demise in 985. Concluding remarks. 
It was under the Kalbids that Sicily became a vital province of the Fatimid realms. The recently rediscovered Fatimid maritime maps produced during the reign of the seventh Fatimid Imam Caliph Zahir illustrate the island's continued importance in the Fatimid Mediterranean, with Sicily forming the westernmost boundary of the Fatimid naval trading networks, showcasing the power and reach of the Fatimid Caliphate during its Egyptian phase. While Kalbid rulers would face its own, while the Kalbid, sorry, while Kalbid rule would face its own vicissitudes in the early 11th century, the survival of gold coins minted in Palermo in a Zahir's name and in the time of Al-Mustan Sirbila testifies to the continued impact of Fatimid influence over the island. The leadership of the Kalbids in Sicily and the African mainland rendered them a multi-generational dynastic household, second in importance only to that of the Fatimids. First of all, I would like to thank the Institute of Islamic Studies um, for inviting me to this very special and historical conference of Mr. Dothan, after he informed us in his opening remarks. I represent here, or I present here a small excerpt from my ongoing, ongoing historical research on the Fatimid and post Fatimid literary tradition. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I open my talk with this flower. Most of you have already admired it. It embellishes Celia Cortese's Isma catalog, Ismaili, and other manuscripts, other Arabic manuscripts, a descriptive catalog of manuscripts in the library of the Institute of Ismaili Studies. Okay. Published in 2000. The beautiful flower originates from a manuscript from Syria, which belongs to the estate of the known scholar Mustafa Raleb from Salamir. Raleb died in 1981, and parts of his collection have been achieved by the Institute of Ismaili Studies. In the catalog, the manuscript is listed under Majmuat, collected works together with Majmuat of other regions and origins. In the description, which concentrate mainly on the identification of works and authors, the provenance is not explicitly mentioned. Um, we do not know much about the literary heritage of the small Ismaili community in Syria. A large. Can you speak into the mic. Okay. So, okay. So we do not we do not we do not know much about the literary heritage. Is this okay now? Yes. Of the small um, Ismaili community in Syria, a largely isolated enclave in the course of its history up to the 19th century. So which one should I take? The left? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> this is a slide. The mini state of castles have been founded in, ha, has been founded by the prominent Ismaili leader Rashid al Din Sinan, Sheikh al Jabal, around eleven sixty two and held its own against Grassaders, Sangits, and then later Ayyubids. In, 19, in, 1216, in 1216, it was subjugated by the Mamluk Baibars. The century after, the centuries after, the Ismailis lived under Mamluk and Ottoman rule. While the followers of the Taibi branch of the Ismaili, Ismailia understand themselves as the proud heirs of the religious and historiographical Fatimid literary tradition and some richly um, filled libraries of the Taibi Bohras have recently been opened, there is a dramatic gap in the documentation of the literary tradition of the, in the Nisari sphere of the Ismailia. In his small chapter on Syria of his fundamental bio biography of Ismaili literature from 1977, Ismail uh, Punawala documents 15 authors and 35 works, of which are nine, with one or more manuscripts. 
Um, in addition, he lists six an anonymous authors as manu manuscripts and three much more art from Syria. Cortes's catalog, um, in, in Cortes's catalog, I was able to identify 10 Majmu'at art with a clear connection to Syria, recognizable by names of authors and scribes. Indeed, Cortes's catalog and Punawala's biography are the only reference work for literature of the Nisari Dawa in Syria available to us. In general, Ismaili manuscripts in Syria are kept in private libraries. They are protected. They are not openly documented. There are many reasons for this. An obvious reason, of course, is their exclusive religious character, which gives these manuscripts a very special significance for the religious and cultural identity of this small community. Up to the 20th century, the Ismailis of Syria have been seriously um, threatened by um, the bloody family and land conflicts with the numerically uh, far superior Nusairis, whom, um, who from the um, early 20th centuries called themselves Alawilun or Alawits. The French consul in Aleppo, Jean, um, Jean, Jean Baptiste Rousseau, give, uh, gives a detailed account as a contemporary witness to an attack by the Nusairis on the Ismaili Amir, Amir Mustafa Idris in 1809 which was followed by a devastating massacre of the population and the almost complete destruction of the, their property, including the books and family collections. This, uh, this event, according to Rousseau, plunged the Nisari Ismailis of Syria into lasting misery and poverty. Violence of the part of the Ottoman state power is another reason. It began when the majority of the Ismailis of Syria joined the Imamat of the Imamat line of Arakan in India um, around 1890. The regular payment of zakat to Arakan III, Muhammad Shah, were considered treason by the Ottomans who reacted by, arrested, by arresting and executing Ismaili leaders and scholars and destroying their cultural heritage. Ladies and gentlemen, in the framework of the Bibliotheca Arabica project in Leipzig, I'm preparing a case study on the transregional transmission of Fatimid literature. This is a project. You, who, who is interested, whoever can um, have a closer look on this slide. Um, I'm preparing a case study on the transregional transmission of Fatimid literature. Bibliotheca Arabica is a long-term project, research project within the framework of the German Academy's um, program. It aims to contribute to the research of Arabic literature um, between the 13th and the 19th century in the form of case studies. Its central approach is to shed new light on the history of Arabic and Islamic literatures with a transmission historical um, transmission historical approach based on manuscripts, thus revisioning and complementing the historiography of literature that is mostly based on editions and oftentimes neglects genres, social and political context, as well as minorities, which produce, transmit, receive, and collect literature under completely different conditions than Sunni authors and readers. This adopts the case of Fatimid um, Ismaili um, literature, Fatimid and post-Fatimid Ismaili literature seems to be productive in this conceptual framework, as is shown in the very remarkable volume edited recently by Waffen Mokman. However, in the course of this research, I repeatedly ask myself, um, how do research a literary history whose manuscripts, as in the case of the Syrian Ismailis, are largely hidden, unrecorded, and in the worst case, destroyed and lost, which a text circulated here, how can we gain, gain insight into the conditions and forms of their production, transmission, and reception? 
to get closer to the answers to answers she mentioned Majmu art in the collection of the institute of ismaili studies have proven to be intriguing and valuable since they open insight into the otherwise hidden literary history and manuscript culture of the small ismaili community in syria um, i lastly visited the institute um, in uh, february 2020 and was given, micro-friendly given, um, manus, manuscript, microfilm copies of three Majmur art here underlined, which are also the oldest of this mentioned group of ten. One bears a, one bears a colophon from the year 1241, this is 1826, the others two other tools from 1310, this is 1892. The originals remained inaccessible to me, thus I could not examine the material, the, the paper, the binding more closely. As was evident from the uh, foliation, one of these ma manuscripts is a multiple text manuscript, which is by definition a corticological unit with one or more texts worked uh, within a single operation. Mm -hmm. And the other two manuscripts are composite manuscripts, corticological units uh, made up of formally independent units, which means of, um, from parts of other manuscripts. I could access the scans supplemented by Cortese's description of 10 catalogs, 10 Rajmur art in her catalog under the following um, aspects. So let me present you some observations and findings. First, in the field of manuscript culture, context, context, content and context of use. Together, the Rajmur art contain about 100 text units, blocks of Prose alternate with blocks of poetry. Each manuscript contains a unique comp compilation of text and has been kept in private or family libraries. In such libraries, Mustafa Raleb must have acquired the much more art uh, for his collection. So, you see the stamp here. Among the prose genres, one encounters Razail on body, soul, and science, on spiritual and physical words, and eschatology. Ta'avil um, uh, yeah, of exoteric and esoteric doctrines. The hierarchy of the Dawa is listed, and the text of the Acht um, is taken, um, taken on occasion of the initiation as reproduced. We find Kalam, Hadith, Rivayat, of the six Imams and the Prophet Masail um, in form of question-answer dia dialogues. The speech forms also consist of excerpts from Majalis um, and Khutab. Alternating with these texts are blocks of mystical kasidas and local anashid and more rarely um, prayers and invocations. The quantitative proportion of prose and poetry, poetic forms varies. In most Manuscripts, prose texts predominate. We can also find texts and variants whose history of transmission is highly interesting, such as Shamsedina Tayyibis, Dustur al Maula um, um, Allah Adin, dedicated to the Isa Nisari Imam Allah Adin Muhammad III in Alamut, and Manakib Adaula Rashid Adin, uh, Rashid Adin Muhu uh, Asalam. Um, which I will come to briefly in a moment. Due to the predominant, predominant, no, predominantly esoteric context, it is probable that some owners of the much more art may have been Shuyu, who initiate the community members and then pass on knowledge to them according to their level of spiritual maturity. According to an oral source of the region, the manuscript were under the, until, were used until the 20th century in subterranean premises called Ostia for purposes of teaching and communal reading. The owner of, no, okay, thanks to one of his descendants, I was able to um, identify the former owner of two of my composite manuscripts that I got as microfilm copies from 1892. His name is um, Mustafa Tamir Mirza, who held the high office, office, office 
of Treasurer in Salamir around 8087 in the name of the very young, uh, still very young Arakan III in Bombay. The Sheikh and scholar immortalized himself by name, by name in one of the two manuscripts. No, in, in both manuscripts. He apparently called his two collections of text Al Kashkul. This designation is according to my view, um, probably revealing, albeit figuratively. Possibly the owner chose the term Kashkul to indicate the function of his two books as repositorial, repositories of miscellanea and to express his esteem and appreciation for them. In fact, each of these two collections of text takes on his own collect, uh, character through the specifics of its um, of um, takes on its own character. Um, yes, through this um, because um, is, it is an often um, um, it is a very special um, it has a very special um, character. Kashkul Kashkul is an often um, elaborately crafted bowl in the shape of a small ship. Darvishes carry this. Um, um, bowls on, on a chain over the uh, shoulder to collect arms and gift. Al Kashkul is also um, to be the title of the famous anthology of the Shi'i scholar and mystic Baha Adin al Amali. In fact, each of these two collections of texts takes on its own character here through the specifics of its composition, which obviously goes back to a careful individual selection and the handicraft of the Ismaili scholar. How much time do you have? Five minutes? Four minutes. Three minutes. Three, four minutes. Okay. Um, so my next slide, it's already history of transmission. Second history, um, some observations to the history of transmission of this text. Um, I just show you this slide. And um, you can read it in detail if, detail if you um, are interested. In any case, it is interesting to see the extent of literary relations of this compilation. This gives us historical information on the strong importance of the local tradition, but also on the connectedness of the Ismailis in Syria to the Fatimid and the post-Fatimid transregional Ismaili tradition and to a broader Shi'i and Islamic literary um, tradition. So, last but not least, variance um, and religious dynamics. Um, I would just point out very briefly that transmission historical research with manuscripts can also bring interesting variants to light. In the manuscript 1080, 18, dated 1826, we find an interesting variant of the work Manakib Adaula Rashid Adin, going back to the oral tradition that was probably written down about 100 years after his death in, eight, in 1193. Here is the beginning of the work in the, in the uh, Majmu'a, and this is the end, you see again, at the end of my um, talk, the beautiful um, flower. Just some words, a manuscript. Um, with this work was first edited by Guyard in 1877. Here in Guyard's edition, um, we find eight apocryphal traditions about Sinan. It is told that Sinan recognizes in real, wild or even domesticated animals the souls of formerly deceased humans or animals and reacts compassionately to them. Exactly these stories are omitted in the London manuscript, only these eight stories. There is evidence from some sources that Sinan had many followers among the Nusairis, and he is said to have modified the Ismaili doctrine of salvation in favor of an approximation to the Nusairi doctrine, which implies the belief in Tanasuch um, or the transmigration of souls from animals to men. Uh, I've, uh, or from, from man to animal. Um, yeah. Fahad Daftari uh, uh, has described in more detail in his monumental work, the Ismailis. Uh, Sinan's doctrinaire solo efforts led 
and this led to the, the Grand Master of Alamut and apparently also some Isma or Ismailis of the region seeking his life. Such variants bear witness to the religious controversies and dynamics in the region. Even so, I could give a very small, only a very small insight. I hope I have been able to give you an impression that the Majmu'at are a productive field that can give us information about the history of literature in its social and political context, in its local and translocal context. In particular, Majmu'at are, are valuable sources for the histories of minorities and communities about which other sources often remain silent. Thank you very much. Sorry for... So again, I want to thank the Institute uh, for convening and Darius for convening this important conference, third conference on the state of the field. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. yeah. And of course, Dr. Dufter, I want to thank him for gracing the stage with us. <clears throat> um, so in my paper, I'm not going to provide a scientific, uh, but hopefully more optimistic story um, that's a bit more impressionable about the role of the Salehid state and uh, which is a medieval Yemeni state, and the legacy that it left for the Tayyibi Ismaili, subsequently the Daudi Tayyibi Ismaili or Bohra community. So I'll begin with a story. <clears throat> In 1902, a young Bohra named Ibrahimji Norbai Adamji traveled from his family's home and business in Mombasa, Kenya, into the interior of East Africa. This was the first of five voyages he made between 1902 and 1905, and subsequently described in a rare memoir that was translated by Sharifa Keshavji and published in 1997. Ibrahimji's purpose was to chase down debtors and recoup family business losses by retrieving a consignment of ivory that a partner had acquired from the Kenyan and Ugandan hinterland. Ibrahimji was the youngest of four brothers of a family firm in Mombasa that supplied British colonial administration with necessities from a German metalworks firm. In that respect, the Adam G family engaged in a business specialization that col colonial gazetteers of the Bombay presidency normally associated with the Bohra community in Gujarat as retailers of metalworks or metal goods. Unacknowledged in such colonial archives, however, was the more varied activities of enterprising Bohras who realized that greater profits were to be made from the trade in ivory. And so an intrepid 17-year-old Ibrahimji traveled forth in search of it. His five journeys took him much further than the new rail station of Nairobi, across Kenya, and ultimately to Entebbe on the shores of Lake Victoria in Uganda. The journeys were arduous beyond the rail stations and end of the railway. Ibrahimji walked for miles without provisions, slept in the open, endured cold and rain, and possibly fatal encounters with wildlife, all the while relying on a surprisingly extensive network of Bohra and Hoja businessmen, their ivory procuring Baluch subcontractors, and various indigenous communities they supplied with general goods. It's a story that Hollywood portrayed, although with litter-born European buanas trailed by African porters bearing all the comforts of civilization, such as tents, beds, and a full complement of dinner service. But alongside Livingston and Burton, there was Ibrahimji, who was equally, if not originally, out of Africa. Even though Ibrahimji's story was overlooked by Hollywood, and in fact, by the scholarship, by most scholarship about trade across the Indian Ocean, his memoir echoes the experiences of Bohra merchants across the many centuries of, India, of their participation in Indian Ocean trade, and how the wealth generated by their entrepreneurship sustained other merchants like them through loans and social services and that also supported communal religious institutions and personnel. While the Indian Ocean, while Indian Ocean scholarship has occasionally noted the activities of Bahra merchants in the Indian Ocean, 
It has, for the most part, presumed the disinterest of hinterland states toward maritime commerce and activity, even while these states taxed and benefited from the trade that reached their shores. As the Dean of the Indian Ocean Studies, Michael Pearson has argued, normally rulers did not care what merchants did. This presumed disinterest of especially Muslim states in maritime trade has led scholars to, for example, refer to correspondence of Jewish merchants in the Geniza, which has provided clues as to the medieval networks connecting Mediterranean and Indian Ocean trade. And with regard to Yemen's role in it, Roxani Margariti has explored the place of Aden in these networks. Eng Seng Ho's seminal gra Graves of Tarim surveys the movement of diasporic Yemenis over the same period from the Hadramaut to East, Southeast Asia and back in affirmation of genealogical roots in Yemen. From the early modern period or 15th century, of course, European archives become a fraught, if necessary, means of gaining information about trade in the Indian Ocean. To the extent that colonial officials identified Indian merchants they competed with or who supplied them the stuff of their trade, we have been informed by them, for example, of one 17th century Bohra named Abdul Ghaffar, who died in 1718, of Surat, whose fleet of 18 ships plied the Indian Ocean, outdoing company ships in supplying the Yemen with Indian cloth and transporting coffee from there to Mecca where it was purchased by pilgrims and Ottoman officials for consumption in their heartland. Ashin Dasgupta, in particular, traced the story of three generations of Abdul Hafar's family in British and Dutch archives to discover not only the extent of their wealth and activities in the Indian Ocean, but also to observe that even after the entry of Europeans there, Indian merchants like Abdul Hafar leveraged their excess to workshops in the Indian interior and their service in supplying certain commodities to the Mughal court to maintain their presence in the ocean and profit from its markets. This is also echoed in transcripts, for example, uh, transcripts of, for example, Mughal decrees issued in the time of Akbar, who died in 1605, which likewise note the services of the Bohra community in supplying the court. The rise of European companies in India and the Indian Ocean trade from the 16th century began to change the relationship between Bahra and other Indian merchants from competition to codependence, leading to petitions to these companies for protection. India office records contain references to Bahra merchants from Surat petitioning company officials in the late 1790s and again in 1825 for military escort on their voyages to Moha port in Yemen, worried that their goods would be confiscated by greedy Ottoman officials there or stolen by pirates on the high seas. We also have another notice from 1831 regarding the turning over of effects of a Bahra merchant who happened to die in Muscat to his heirs. The relationship of codependence began to be expressed in the declaration of the 42nd Dai, Yusuf Najmuddin, in 1795. I have ever considered myself under the protection of the flag of the Honorable English Company for protection of my life and property. <laughs> By the late 19th century, Bahra merchants and Dais, of course, had yet a different relationship with British colonial presence in India, having been fully co-opted into the colonial economy and colonial order, as reflected in the granting in 1866 of first-class sardarship to the 47th Dai, Abdul Qadir Najmuddin. The trade of Bohra and other Muslim merchants in the Indian Ocean, of course, was also accompanied by the dissemination of their faith. As we know, Islam accompanied trade beyond the limits of conquest to Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, presumably because of the usefulness of its law and because the study of its scriptures and rituals conferred the necessary abru or reputation for integrity that was critical to merchant success. Knowledge of Sharia facilitated trade and knowledge of Quran and the establishing of pious endowments enhanced honor. But Bohra activity in the Indian Ocean was of a different stripe. The entry of Bohra merchants into the trade networks of the Indian Ocean was state authored and the, fa and the faith that connected them to the Islamic heartland was of particular variety that was not in any obvious way beneficial to their commerce. 
The relation, that relationship between trade and faith for Bahra merchants was initiated in the 11th century by the Sulayhid dynasty in Yemen. The dynasty, as you know, was established by Ali bin Muhammad al sulayhi in 1047. A convert to Ismaili Shiism, Ali al sulayhi had been active in propagating the faith in Yemen and the west coast of Arabia as a pilgrimage leader from the 1030s. And because of this, he earned the title of Dai. But it was through his conquest, which encompassed for a time all of the Yemen as we know it today, that led to his being given recognition and support by the Fatimid Imam Caliph at the time, Al Mustansir, who reigned from 1036 to 1094. You're doing okay on time? Okay. <laughs> However, his conquest. <laughs> Rushing along. However, his conquest generated the enmity of the Zaydi Imam to the north of Sana'a, which Ali al Sulehi had conquered for his capital, and the Najahid dynasty to the south of Hamdan tribal lands in central Yemen that had supported their fellow tribesmen, al Sulehi. As a result, his son and successor, al Muqarram Ahmed, found himself with the task of reconquering many of the territories that that had originally been brought under Sulayhid control. al muqarram Ahmed was eventually incapacitated by battle injuries after 1074. This brought to the fore his wife and successor Arwa, also known as al Sayyid al-Hurra, al-Malika al-Hurra, al-Malika Arwa, you can take your pick, who ruled Yemen until her death over 60 years later in 1138. Like the dynasty's founder, Ali al-Sulehi, al muqarram Ahmed and Arwa were recognized as rulers and dais by their Fatimid Imam Caliph overlords. A series of Fatimid sujulat or decrees issued from the time of al-Mustansir to that of his successor al-Mustali, who died in 1101, and his successor in turn, al-Amir, who died in 1130, confer the title of dai on all three members of the dynasty. These decrees and other correspondence from the Fatimid Center were issued as well by members of the Imam Caliph's families and senior dais, most famous among them, al muayyid Fiddina Shirazi, who, among other things, directed Fatimid attention to the Yemen, as well as most famously being involved in the Basasiri affair, which, allowed, which led to the capital of Baghdad, uh, sorry, the, capital, the Abbasid capital of Baghdad declaring in favor of the Fatimids it's another long story. Moreover, two decrees in particular from the Fatimid Center issued in 1075 and in 1089 explicitly conferred jurisdiction of both al muqarram and Arwa, and then Arwa alone, over the Ismaili Dawa further to the east in Oman, Bahrain, and India, and over its trade. Evidently, this was due to the revenue that historically arrived to Yemen from these regions, as noted by two historians of the dynasty, the contemporary Omar al-Yemeni and the 15th century Da'i Idris Imad al-Din. Both mention revenue that Arwa obtained from the port of Aden, which had been gifted to her by her father-in-law Ali al-Sulehi, and then lost when Aden's vassal broke with Arwa, over yet another succession crisis at the Fatimid center. This crisis, in fact, led to an important development, the establishment of a new dawa or branch of Ismaili Shiism by Arwa after 1130. The death in that year of the Fatimid Imam Caliph al-Amr led to court maneuvers that bypassed the succession of his infant son, Atayib. Arwa declared in favor of Atayib and thus broke with the Fatimid center, establishing a new dawa with a new ecclesiastical hierarchy that she appointed. This singular and unprecedented action by a woman in Islamic history was not, to, not, was not only going to inaugurate a new branch of Ismaili Shiism, but also a new exclusive relationship between Yemen and India and the now Tayyibi Ismaili community. In the surmises of scholars as to why Arwa broke with the Fatimid Caliphate itself in its last decades, local and global factors are cited. Local factors included the inability of the Sulayhids and their supporters to best unremitting tribal rebellions against them, the return to the fray of the previously defeated Najahids, and the, a new leadership among the Zaydis, which was determined to press their advantage against the Ismailis, 
and then the secession or uh, betrayal of some of Sulayhid uh, vassals like the ones that controlled Aden. As for global factors, the instability of the Fatimid Caliphate no doubt figured in Arwa's bid for autonomy, as well as the importance of its Indian community and merchants. We know from Fatimid decrees of the time of Al-Mustansir, the name of two dais sent to Gujarat beginning in 1067, Abdullah and Marsaban. Bohra historians attribute to them the conversion of a trading caste of Gujarat, the Bohra, hence Bohra, to Ismaili Shiism based on miracles and miraculous conversions. Regardless, there does seem to be hard evidence of the success of Dais to India in converting the segments of the population and converting some segments of the population of Gujarat in the form of a 12th century mosque and mausoleum complex in the village of Badreshwar. Am I correctly pronouncing it? <laughs> okay. Um, in the Kutch district, Kutch, Kutch district of Gujarat. It's a complicated thing to manage the many languages of this audience, Gujarati, Arabic, Persian. Um, Merdad, oh, sorry, to go back. Um, so in the Kutch district of Gujarat, and I'm using up valuable time. Mm, first described in an archeological survey during the colonial period, it was later studied by Z.A. Desai in 1960, in 1965, who proposed 1159 or 1160 as the dating of the mosque and mausoleum and identified the surviving inscriptions as Kufic in the Fatimid style. Merdad Shukuhi later investigated the wording of the inscriptions, discovering references to the Ahlul Bayt as well as another unknown individual. And this indicated for him a connection both style and substance to the presence of an Ismaili community. At the same time, a Jain chronicle of this period mentions a mosque built at the time for the Ismaili trading community of the town. Thus, we have evidence not only of an enduring Ismaili presence in Gujarat from the 12th century, but one that seems to bear the imprint of official sponsorship. At the other end of the Indian Ocean, a similar study by Mikhail Muilbar of inscriptions of the Church of Wukro Cherkos in the Ethiopian highlands revealed Kufic inscriptions and architectural features that clearly resemble those of both the Fatimid center and replicate features of Arwa's mosque in Yemen. As well, funerary stele off the coast in the Dahlak archipelago bear Yemeni surnames and Ismaili confessions in their inscriptions. This evidence suggests to Mulbauer an official Sulayid effort to extend and connect trade from Yemen to East Africa. And Ibrahimji might have been following in those steps many centuries later. Additionally, Sulayid investment in Indian Ocean trade is also reflected in the usual bureaucratic apparatus of medieval Muslim states and ports, Araiz Tujar and Amatjar Sultani, or Commerce Bureau, in Sulayhid Yemen, as R.B. Sargent has noted. For Bohra merchants, the demise of the Sulayhid state did not keep them from Yemen's shores, as is clear from the episode of Abdul Ghaffar. But trade was not the only reason that brought Bohras to Yemen. As we know from Yemeni as well as Bohra chronicles, like the Mosami Bahar, the traffic between Yemen and India also included that of religious scholars in search of the knowledge that would enable them to be considered for offices in the Dawah or simply as a matter of faith. Hussein Hamdani, in fact, noted that the pursuit of religious knowledge among the Tayyibi and later Daudi Tayyibi or Bohra Ismailis was considered Ibada al uh, worship of God as intellectual pursuit, a necessary complement to Ibada Amaliyya, worship as practice. Perhaps a prime example of such undertakings was, of course, Hassan bin Nuh al Baharuchi, who died in 1533. The author of the seventh volume, uh, Kitab al Azhar, which is a chrestomathy of literature. Because of a desire to pursue knowledge, he left home in Kambay, India, and went to Yemen in 1498 to study under the 20th. Tayyibi Ismaili Dai at the time, Al-Hassan bin Idris. Al-Baruchi discusses his progress 
in the first volume of the Kitab al-Azhar, saying that his higher education required the reading and recitation back to the Dai of 37 works in planned succession. This type of training enabled him to compile his anthology, as well as to subsequently train the future 24th Dai, a fellow Indian named Yusuf bin Suleiman. Among the works he lists that formed his higher education curriculum was the Majmua Tarbiya, a miscellany of texts apparently originally compiled in the 12th century and continuously copied among Bohra scholarly families until the 19th century. In her seminal study of the Tarbiya corpus, Delia Cortesi alludes to many of the complex issues involved in establishing authorship and function of these educational texts. Usually copied in two volumes, the Majmua appears to offer a course of study from exoteric to esoteric and appears to have been part of the education not only of Haruchi, but contemporaries like Mian Shamaon and subsequent scholars of the 18th and 19th century like Sheikh Lukmanji, Chan Khan, and Abd Musa. While content of the Majmua do not seem to have been sourced for the major works produced by Bohra scholars like Al Baruchi, she adds, copies of it nevertheless proliferated among Bohra families, especially by the end of the 19th century. Among the corpus of Majmua copies are those that belong to the family of Muhammad Ali al Hamdani, who died in 1898. Originally from a Yemeni scholarly family established in Surat until the, since the mid 18th century, Muhammad Ali acquired some fame or notoriety as a member of a Hilf or group of Bohar scholars who spent 11 years in Mecca in the 1870s and 1880s awaiting the appearance of the Imam. For our purposes, it's important to learn that because of his training, he undertook conducting co-ed majalis or halqas of learning for members of the community which featured the teaching of the Majmua, according to biography written by his son, Faidallah. The biography, the Sawanih Omri, also informs us that Muhammad Ali's own education by former teachers of a by then defunct Saifi Dars enabled him to secure funds for a madrasa of his own, serve as advisor to the 48th Dai, Hussam Din, in whose time Muhammad Ali helped to discredit the Mahdi Bag movement, and the 49th Dai, Muhammad Burhan ad Din, who died in 1906. Despite this, as the Sawaniyah informs us, Muhammad Ali did not reap many material rewards. Unlike Baruchi, who was presumably wealthy, right? Uh, Muhammad Ali lived a modest life. So modest, in fact, that his wife routinely applied for loans from the 48th and 49th Dais, and visitors to his home in Mecca during his sojourn there reported him pursuing an austere lifestyle, despite the services he supplied to those who came to Mecca from the community. The 12th century Yemeni compilation of the Majmua then is but one of the many texts that form the pursuit of Ibad al for Al Baruchi and Muhammad Ali as members of the Bahra community. Although neither acquired knowledge as a means of advancement to the office of Dai, even while their learning allowed them to serve as advisors and tutors to them, right? They arguably represented one of the durable connections between India and Yemen, first established by the Sulehid and the Tayyibi Ismaili Dawa. In a recent conversation, a colleague commented that when we think of the Sulehids, we think of them as a brief episode in Yemeni history or in terms of their relationship to the Fatimid Caliphate. The historiography certainly reflects this. What I've tried to suggest, however, is, overlook, is their overlooked importance in the Indian Ocean. While the Sulehid dynasty did not command a fleet or charter companies, what little evidence we have indicates a keen investment in maritime traffic between Yemen and Gujarat in the Indian Ocean through the framework of the Tayyibi Ismaili Dawa. That framework ensured the traffic beyond the death of Arwa endure, uh, continued not only because of commerce, but also because of doctrine that promoted intellectual pursuit as a component of faith. This is not to suggest that no other Muslim presence in the Indian Ocean was similarly animated, simply to say that our understanding of the dissemination of Islam in and through the Indian Ocean included the seeking of its esoteric knowledge as well, producing in the case of the Bohra community, a lasting connection between Yemen and India. Thank you.